Lani, uh, good morning to you in uh, El Paso, and I'm here uh, in Mumbai. It's uh, nine. It's ten ten o'clock, uh, ten p.m. First September. And good morning, uh, El Paso, to you. Yes, well, good afternoon or good evening to you. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> practically it's... two hours from now. It's going to be a good morning. <laughs> good morning, Friday to me. Yeah, it's ten a.m. here. So it's 10 p.m. there. So that's, yeah. oh, wow. So uh, standard work, as you taught me, it has we have to follow it there it, to introduce you. There we go. <laughs> yeah, I, I see your screen now. Yeah. So, uh, Alani, you're on the uh, 34th episode and i started this somewhere around september october last year so it'll be completing a year uh, probably in end of uh, october probably i think first episode i had i started preparing in september last year but first episode i think was somewhere in november i didn't keep track of it but then uh we i have come uh, quite far and we're doing the 34th episode so the series remained the same of support, uh, supporting sustained continuous improvement and uh, you're going to talk to us uh, about improved awareness from just surviving to thriving. I'm just looking forward to hearing all about it from you. I've done this more than four times so far, but I have to do it now. The principal uh, consultant and owner of quality consultants, manager technical, a long years in Chevron, and you were there in Washington University where you did your chemical engineering and then from University of Texas. These are the, the latest one uh, is a science of workforce engagement, both the books I have. And apart from that, you've written the five other books and you're the, one of the persons who have written, the only person probably who have written uh, on lean refining. And we have talked about it in many of our episodes. So without taking much of your time, uh, Let's hear you on improved awareness from just surviving to thriving. And of course, you're on Dr. M. Swartgas. And I'm going to stop sharing uh, my screen and over to you, Lani. Okay, very good. There, can you see my screen, Dr. M? Yeah, I do. Okay, very good. Okay, that's, that, that's just the title of it. Um, going from surviving to thriving. And uh, if you're a consultant like me, you mm -hmm. run into an awful lot of problems where uh, people have very dysfunctional operating systems, but they don't want to change them. And they don't mm -hmm. want to change them because they're, th they're, they're surviving today. Mm -hmm. uh, they are what I call currently adequate. Mm -hmm. And we'll, we'll get into that in just a minute. Mm -hmm. Okay. But the, uh, oops, I got to get this in slideshow mode. Pardon me. Um, there we go. Pardon me. Okay. And, and my position statement is this, and it's simple, that the primary impediment to problem solving is not the lack of technical skills in handling root cause analyses. Mm -hmm. It is not the technical skills in handling root cause analyses. Mm -hmm. Rather, it is the inability and the lack of desire for people to see the problems that they have. Mm -hmm. And, and this, this inability to see causes what I call a lack of competitive awareness. They're not totally blind. Make no mistake about it. They're in business. They're, they're surviving. Uh, they're making a little bit of money. Maybe people are happy. Maybe their stockholders are happy. But they're in danger. Mm -hmm. They're just surviving. They're no longer thriving. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the impediments to this lack of competitive awareness, competitive awareness, mm -hmm. come from really two things. Okay? Mm -hmm. There are psychological limitations. Mm -hmm. uh, much of this is unconscious uh, activity. Mm -hmm. And there are also conscious activities where people are aware of it, but mm -hmm. they just don't want to do it. They have a lack of will to do it. Mm -hmm. They come up with the most imaginative excuses. It used to work. Mm -hmm. um, the list goes on. Mm -hmm. Okay. But that's our focus today. 
Mm -hmm. awareness, the ability, and the desire to see. Mm -hmm. okay? So what does the profile of success look like? I, I told you it's mm -hmm. not the ability to solve technical problems. Mm -hmm. It's not a technical issue at all. Mm -hmm. okay? And I, I got this information years ago. I did a study. Well, not two years ago. Mm -hmm. And I went through my files. Mm -hmm. I went through over 300 individual projects. Mm -hmm. Individual and team from 46 different countries, six, 46 plants, pardon me, mm -hmm. and six different countries. And it covered 27 years mm -hmm. of, of problem solving that I had documented in my computer and other places. Mm -hmm. And and what I found was this. Mm -hmm. uh, we took the program, we, we took the projects, and we broke them into successful and unsuccessful projects. Mm -hmm. And uh, unsuccessful meant they failed to meet all the... Um, all the elements of a, of a, um, all the objectives of the project, pardon me. Mm -hmm. So, um, give me just a minute, Dr. M. I have, I have lost my pointer. I'm not quite sure where it went. Hmm. Well, I guess I'll get by without it. Um, but at any rate, the, the, the situation is this. Mm -hmm. um if we if we look at the problem solving efforts for the successful projects they're in blue mm -hmm. okay and you can see the profile of the blue is dramatically different than the profile of the red mm -hmm. if we look at the successful projects mm -hmm. we spent 63 percent of our time mm -hmm. defining the problem mm -hmm. we could for each one of the projects we knew how many people were involved how long it took we could quantify the amount of time taken mm -hmm. and 60 percent of mm -hmm. the manpower and effort involved in doing the project was taken care of in mm -hmm. the def definition stage. Mm -hmm. For the successful projects, 11% was in what you would classically call typical problem solving. Mm -hmm. okay? And then 25% mm -hmm. was in executing, implementing the solution. Mm -hmm. When we look at the unsuccessful projects or the less than successful, Mm -hmm. Some of them met all of the goals, except they were late. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them were done on time, but they didn't achieve the, the desired yield or whatever might be the key metric. Mm -hmm. okay? But in those, we spent well less than 20% of our time defining the problem. Mm -hmm. and, and when it came to executing the solution, mm -hmm. they claimed they spent 34% of their time mm -hmm. and then implementing it was 50%. Mm. But in fact, and one of the things I could not quantify mm. was in many of these projects, they would get into the, the they'd say they're fully defined. Mm. And if you're, if you've done Six Sigma projects, you know, they have a, a defined measure, analyze, improve, control, the make metric. Mm. And so the steps are pretty well quantified. Mm. Um, and, and in this case, uh, we could, we could do a, a pretty good job of separating them. But what we found out was that sometimes we'd get involved and they get to the solution phase where they needed to start analyzing it. And they said, well, geez, we really don't have this data or this data conflicts with this data and they'd have to go back and maybe do some measurement system analyses or gather some additional data. Mm. But in effect, they were, they were recycling and going back. Okay? Mm. And so ultimately they spent that amount of time in defining, but they, they didn't do it until a later phase. Mm. But the point is, that their inability to solve the problems was not mm. was not a function of the um, inability to come up with root cause analyses and countermeasures. Mm. It was how the project was defined. Mm. So we're going to start talking about that part of definition, and part of it is is seeing the problem, recognizing the problem, mm. understanding what the problem really is, mm. as opposed to root cause analysis. At the same time I did this, this, this whole project, we ought to do a, a webinar on it. It was amazing. Mm -hmm. I, I queried some of my, my uh, comrades, some of my, my peers, and I asked them, when you're hired for problem solving, how much time do you spend on root cause analysis? How much time do you spend on everything else? 87% mm -hmm. of the management requests that come through are to teach people more problem solving skills, 87%. Mm. Mm. And yet that's the smallest part 
of the impediment for successful problem projects. Mm. Okay. Um, and and the successful projects actually 16% were declared successful in all measures. Well, 16%, there's 340 items. So mm -hmm. I think that's about close to 50 items. Mm -hmm. It's not one or two or three successful projects. Mm -hmm. It's a substantial number. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's move on to the agenda. But I want to I want to set that as the basis that it is not finding root cause analyses that is the impediment to to progress. Okay. We're going to talk about what is awareness. We're going to talk about what poor awareness looks like. Mm -hmm. We're going to go through some in-field examples of poor awareness. Mm -hmm. We're going to go through why awareness is the gateway quality to decision making. Mm -hmm. okay. Why, how does this reduced awareness impact the typical business? We've got mm -hmm. an example here of manufacturing excellence with numbers. Okay. What are the four impediments to recognizing these opportunities? Now, the truth is there's, there's probably hundreds of impediments, mm -hmm. but these are what I consider to be the major four. Mm -hmm. And finally, what countermeasures can we apply to exploit these opportunities? What can we do about these impediments? Mm -hmm. So let's dive into what is, what is awareness? Okay. Mm -hmm. the, the the dictionary definition is to be vigilant in observing mm -hmm. in or in drawing inferences from what one sees and hears. Mm -hmm. Okay. I would also include touches and other things, but all of those things apply to your awareness. Mm -hmm. The one I really like is cognizant of reality. Mm -hmm. I find many, many, many plant managers and supervisors and um and team leaders are not cognizant of what's really going on. They're, they're blinded. And we're going to talk about some of those dynamics as we move mm -hmm. forward. Uh, awareness is also defined as the knowledge and understanding that something is happening or exists. Those are just diff dictionary definitions, pardon me. Mm -hmm. okay. However, mm -hmm. competitive awareness mm -hmm. is being better at this than your competition. Mm -hmm. And when you look at some of the things that improve people's awareness, it's mm -hmm. no it's no surprise that you find some awareness tools amongst mm -hmm. your my Japanese clients. Mm -hmm. Principles like Genji Gembutsu. Mm -hmm. You don't hear Western firms talking about going to the Gemba. Mm -hmm. Well, now you do, but earlier you did not. Mm -hmm. About the Ono Circle, mm -hmm. Hansight, Deep Reflection, Nemawashi, mm -hmm. which... Uh, is kind of discussing a topic to death, potion mm. cannery policy deployment. A lot of those things are practiced in, in many of my better Japanese firms. You seldom see those in Western firms. You seldom see them even in some good Western firms. Mm. Okay. But the key question is thought to be, people think, okay, in your efforts to objectively observe the workplace, are you, uh, are you observation biased? Are your observations biased mm. and full of blind spots? Mm. Most people will tell you, well, we got a few there. But the mm. answer to that question is not yes, it's hell yes. <laughs> they are full of all kinds of blind spots. And we'll go through some as, as we move forward. Mm. Okay. The real questions are, are you aware of this unawareness? Mm. Do you recognize that you have blind spots? Mm. And the second question is, what are you doing about it? Mm. Okay. Now, the bottom line is, Everybody has blind spots. Mm. Everybody. The people who teach blind spots have blind spots about what they're teaching. Mm. You know, it's, it's, it's amazing. Mm. But let's talk about awareness. I mentioned it's the gateway quality. Okay? Mm. And the reason I say that mm. is that uh, a problem that is well-defined is 90% solved. Mm. That's a quotation of mine that I use frequently. And uh, I did a problem-solving webinar with Kepner Trigo. Mm. Uh, nationally, it was viewed nationally by, by about 4,000 people. Mm. And uh, you can find it on YouTube and it's there. Mm. I don't want to rehash that, mm. but um, that, that's the whole point of problem solving. If you, if you can't see it, how do you solve it? You know, mm. okay. but years ago I was, uh, I was um, in a men's Bible study group and um, I was the person who had the best Bible study software and, and so I became the researcher for the group. Mm -hmm. And we were studying in the book of Genesis where it said, and God created man in his own image. And mm -hmm. somebody says, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. So I, I started looking at it and I studied it and I actually spent considerable time on it. And mm -hmm. that passage came shortly after God had created all the animals. Mm -hmm. And so I said, hmm, 
he's making a distinction between animals and us. And I started thinking, what is it that we have that animals don't have? Mm -hmm. And I came up with what I call the four gifts from God. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and when we, when we talk about decision-making, mm -hmm. you know, and whether it's with a, 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 an animal or we're animals, I guess, or us or anywhere, mm -hmm. uh, it's that thing that happens between a stimulus and a response. Mm -hmm. okay? And if there's an, the animal condition is the animals act reflexively, you mm -hmm. know, you kick a dog, he either runs away or he bites you. Mm -hmm. fight or flight he doesn't sit around and think about it you know mm -hmm. they respond very quickly okay mm -hmm. the animal con condition is to respond very quickly mm -hmm. and, and in a very narrow range mm -hmm. however we human beings have mm -hmm. a process of deliberation mm -hmm. there is a moment between stimulus and response where we have the opportunity that animals don't have we can think about things mm -hmm. okay? now those four gifts the first one is awareness Mm -hmm. okay. let's say you're you know um you're, you're driving down the freeway and and um and somebody cuts you off mm -hmm. uh, you can either you know be polite and just uh and just uh, give them a little bit of space or you can honk your horn or or you can run up beside them and uh you know make obscene gestures you can do mm -hmm. all kinds of things mm -hmm. okay and so so you have that that moment where you can think about that thing mm -hmm. okay and and from there you have two other skills one is imagination which allows you to conjure up options mm. and and the other is conscious driven values mm. okay how do you make a decision okay let's mm. say that the thing that happens is uh you go to a restaurant and somebody insults your wife mm. okay you could pick up your plate of food and throw it at them okay mm. or you could walk over and tell them i'd appreciate it if you didn't do that Mm -hmm. You could walk over there, smack them in the head. Mm -hmm. You could ignore them. There's all kinds of, of options. Mm -hmm. Your imagination creates these options. And then your your conscience, your values mm -hmm. drive you to make some type of a choice. Mm -hmm. We humans have all of those four gifts that mm -hmm. animals really do not have, at least in plenty. Mm -hmm. And and ultimately, you, you come up with some kind of a response. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then that response has consequences. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's two types of consequences. There's natural consequences and there are social consequences. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's say, let's say Dr. M that you and I decide we're going to go to the university and we're going to get a degree in, I don't know, underwater bebo bobbing. Mm -hmm. And, um, and you are a good student. Mm -hmm. You study, you go to class all the time. You read the material in a timely fashion. You prepare for class. Uh, you stay up with all the reading. Okay, and when it comes time to take the test, you're a smart guy, you get an A. Okay. Mm -hmm. Me, I'm not such a good student. Mm -hmm. I miss class frequently. Mm -hmm. I get the homework done because it's part of the grade, mm -hmm. but uh, I really don't study. Mm -hmm. And and what I do, because I don't do things in a timely fashion, is the night before the test, I cram like crazy. Mm -hmm. But I'm good at that. Mm -hmm. I'm good at that. So I get an A on the test. Well, the A on the test is the social consequence. Mm. It's a social consequence because it's given by a person. Mm. On the other hand, there's a natural mm. response. Mm. And that is because you were a much better student and you studied mm. along the way and mm. you built your knowledge upon other knowledge. Mm. Uh, probably you're going to be a whole lot better at underwater people bobbing than I am. Mm. Okay, So the natural consequence is that you're better. You really absorb that stuff and you learn. Mm -hmm. me i took the test well mm -hmm. now we both have an a mm -hmm. and maybe at the end of the year maybe we both graduate summa cum laude or something mm -hmm. but 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 you have learned more mm -hmm. okay? so to every response there is a natural and a social consequence mm -hmm. at least in our world mm -hmm. there may not be such a social consequence to the to the animals but to us there is mm -hmm. okay and so that's what i call the four gifts from god in, in mm -hmm. decision making mm -hmm. okay now, our deliberation is mm -hmm. two things, and mm -hmm. this becomes very, very important later in our, our talk. Mm -hmm. One is analysis, mm -hmm. and analysis is, is, is taking things and tearing them down. Pardon mm -hmm. me, got ahead of myself. Okay. And, and that's, what, that's what academics and that's what professors are, are good at. Mm -hmm. Synthesis is taking that information and putting it back together again. Mm -hmm. okay. so it doesn't do you any good if you want to improve the operation of your car if you take it all apart ultimately mm -hmm. you got to put it back together again mm -hmm. okay 
And that's what a deliberative process is. It's both analysis, taking mm -hmm. things apart, and synthesis, putting things together. Mm -hmm. okay? And we can do that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, the gateway quality to all of this is awareness. Mm -hmm. If there is no awareness, mm -hmm. there is no imagination in creating options. Mm -hmm. There is no, no decision to make. Mm -hmm. There is no choice. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if you limit your awareness, you limit your ability to make choices or your ability to solve problems. Mm -hmm. okay? And I like to say, you know, if you want to have no problems, just don't look. <laughs> And if you don't look, you'll have no problems and life will be happy. Well, mm. ultimately, there's consequences from that as well. Mm. Okay? But it all starts with awareness and it ends with action. And mm. the action is precipitated by your ability to make a decision. Mm. And by the way, Doc, if you've got some questions, don't hesitate to interrupt me, please. But what does poor awareness look like? Mm. Okay? Everybody thinks... They are very vigilant. Mm. If you ask people, you know, 99% of them will be better than average, <laughs> mm. which is something that always amazes me. People think that's true. Mm. Um, so we're going to look at a firm called Manufacturing Excellence. It's a real firm. That doesn't happen to be its name. Okay. Mm. And we're going to perform what's called a causal study. I'll explain the causal study to you in just a minute. Mm. But it's a means to quantify the problems and see how they affect the operations, the people. And in this case, overall profitability mm -hmm. okay we'll break down this causal study to get deeper into the problems mm -hmm. and and we're going to find out that they not they're not what they seem to be mm -hmm. the problems seem to be one thing but when you heighten your awareness they actually turn out to be something else mm -hmm. okay so here's some background information on manufacturing excellence okay mm -hmm. they're a t1 tier one supplier to the automobile industry mm -hmm. We were hired by Steve, who was the director in charge of all manufacturing operations. Mm. This facility had, I think, about 1,200 employees. Mm. And uh, Steve was the director, and he explained to us this. Mm. He said, Lonnie, our cost of nonconformance in scrap, rework, overtime, and expediting, mm. not counting the cost of the inspectors, mm. was $3.9 million last year, mm. uh, $225 million worth of sales. Mm. and $12 million worth of profit. Mm. Okay. As you taught us yesterday, I had been there the day previously and we looked at their inventory. Mm. We're carrying an extra $3.5 million in finished goods inventory mm. to attain good on-time delivery. Mm. And, and most of this cost of inventory is related directly to the quality issues. Mm. I believe that if we got better execution, we mm. could make a substantial reduction in mm. all of these losses. Mm. And it looks like we can improve our profit margins from the 6% mm. range mm. to a much healthier 10% range. Mm. I am convinced we have an execution problem and would like to get to the bottom of it. Mm. Okay. Well, let's look at, at what, what this 6%, actually, Steve wasn't a very good calculator, and I'll show mm. you that in a second, what, what that 6% range really means. Mm. Okay. And so we were asked to evaluate their execution and we told them we would conduct a ca causal study to get some hard data. Mm. Okay. But, but let's look at what 5.3% profit means. If you're a tier one supplier in the automobile industry, mm. if you're selling Christmas trees or, or you're, you know, a street vendor, 5.3% might, might be hideously low. Okay. Mm. But in the, in the tier one business, the automobile industry, 5.3% is not horrible. Okay. Mm. They target around 7%. Mm. If you're at 7%, you're kind of at the sweet spot with your, mm. with your uh, customer. Mm. Okay? And they have what I call a does not draw too much attention range. Mm. If you fall in this range mm. of 5% to 9%, you mm. don't get a whole lot of attention from the, from the supplier mm. as long as you're delivering good quality on time. Mm. Excuse me. Does not draw too much attention from your customer. Mm. If you're if you're delivering on time high quality product, mm. however, if you get below five percent, they worry about you mm. because they worry: is this company going to stay in business? Are they reliable? Mm. Okay, and if if you're not reliable, they start paying all kinds of attention to you. Mm. The better companies send help. Toyota and Honda, I know, have a lead suppliers network support mechanism, mm. and they send people out to help you. And by helping you, I don't mean you know beat you down to a lower price. They're there to really help. Mm. Okay. 
On the other hand, if you're at the other end, mm -hmm. if you're way over 9%, mm -hmm. they, they start worrying because you're too expensive. Mm -hmm. And they will go out and actively seek out competitors mm -hmm. to drive the prices down. Mm -hmm. So if, if you are outside of this range, you have problems with your customer one way or another. Mm -hmm. okay. So, so what do you want to be? You want to be in that range where, where is manufacturing excellence? They're at 5.3. They're right there. Mm -hmm. If you take 12 million and divide it by 225, you don't get 6%, you get 5.3%. So mm -hmm. Steve was kind of generous in his analysis. Mm -hmm. And that's where manufacturing excellence is. And they are surviving. Mm -hmm. They're not thriving. Mm -hmm. They're surviving. Mm -hmm. okay? Now, if they could capture these things that Steve was talking about, mm -hmm. they could get up to 8.6%. Mm -hmm. Again, not 10, but 8.6%. And you can see that's a much healthier place. Mm -hmm. A much healthier place. Mm -hmm. okay? I actually did some other work with them later in the week. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was no doubt that we could get them to the 13 or 14% range mm -hmm. inside a year or 18 months. Mm -hmm. okay. But just these three things that they were talking about over time, expediting and and um, and um, air freight were, were causing these issues. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, the problem is when they're in this range over here mm -hmm. between, you know, six and four percent, mm -hmm. the management desperately wants to believe that their systems are currently adequate. Mm -hmm. Okay. The company's not bugging them too much. You know, mm. they're still kind of okay. Mm. okay. But the reality is they are barely adequate. Mm. And their adequacy is a mirage. But they use it as an excuse for not improving. Why mm. change? We're doing okay. Mm. You know, we're making ends meet. We made $12 million this year, etc. Mm. And I hear that all the time. Mm. What they don't appreciate is mm. that it's 5.3% today. Mm. Next year, it's going to be 4.3%. Mm. Because somebody's going to do it better. Somebody's going to do it cheaper. Mm. Okay. So let, let's dive into the causal study. Okay? Mm. And, and what the causal study is, the purpose is to find problems on the manufacturing floor and mm. see if you can't come up with a lot of really quick solutions. Mm. Okay? And, and what you do is you evaluate three things. Mm. Do the workers on the floor know what to do? Mm. Do they know how to do it? Mm. And do they have the resources to do it? Mm. If you can answer yes to all three of those questions, mm. then the problems are related to the workers. Mm. Okay. So the purpose of the causal study is to break this down into what you might call worker problems or system problems. Mm. Okay. And in this case, manufacturing excellence calls it an execution issue. issue pardon mm. me. If the answer is no, mm. then there's a problem with the manufacturing system and somebody must supply information or resources mm. or standards or whatever to mm. the operator so the operator can do his job. Mm. Okay. So, so how do you execute this causal study? Okay. Mm. So to do a causal study, you literally walk the floor and you find things not right. Mm. And, and in this case, I was given the easiest of the chores mm. because when we went to find things wrong, not right, they said, well, you know, Lonnie, you're not very familiar with the facility. So mm. we're going to send you the rework station. That's the place where we always know that things are not done right because they're done at rework. Mm. Okay. And you can't do this with just anybody. You need to do it with experienced and critical observers. Mm. Um, and in this case, there was myself, the mm. director of engineering for the entire facility, mm. uh, one senior production supervisor, and a quality mm. engineer. Mm. There were the four of us. Mm. And we walk the floor to mm. determine the sources of their problems. Mm. Okay. And it's simple. You see something not right and you ask five questions. Mm. Now there's a lot of information here, but I'll I'll see if I can't keep it clear. And if I get if I confuse you, ask a question, please. Sure, right? sure. But you you ask five questions. Mm. And the first question has to do: does the worker know what to do? Okay. Mm. Now that's a general question, but mm. the specific question is. Mm. Is there a written standard describing the order of operations? Mm. Is there some document that you can look at and says they do A and then B and then C and then D? Mm. Okay. And if there is, mm. then the operator ought to know what to do. Mm. The second one is, that, does the operator know how to do it? Mm. Okay. Now, how is the quality question? 
Are there specific performance standards for the results? Is mm -hmm. the specific question, second specific, mm -hmm. second specific question you ask. Mm -hmm. And the third question is, has he been trained on these standards? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, the, the, we get down to the third major point is, does the worker have the resources necessary to complete the task? Mm -hmm. And there are two questions associated with that. Mm -hmm. Has a proper 5S system been set up so he has all the tools and materials, etc.? Mm -hmm. And the fifth question is, does he have the time to perform the described work? Mm -hmm. Can he get his task done within the cycle time? Mm -hmm. Okay. So everywhere we went, we asked those five questions. Mm -hmm. And as long as we got a yes to each one of them, we said, okay, it's mm -hmm. probably an execution issue. Mm -hmm. And, and if you get a no answer anywhere, you quit answer, asking questions because you know <clears throat> there's a system deficiency. <clears throat> Something the operator needs has not been supplied. <clears throat> okay. And we spent four hours on the floor, the four of us spent four hours on the floor observing, and we found over 300 things not done right. <clears throat> 300. <clears throat> now, some people talk about going on a waste walk. For <clears throat> my money, I think waste walks are a total waste of time. Mm. They don't really address what, what you're trying to do. Mm. Um, but but they're a way to find things that, that improvement opportunities. Mm. Okay? But um I'm I'm not a big fan of waste walks. I am a big fan of causal studies. Mm. Okay. And when we got back together, this is what we found. Mm. We found that 30% were due to system design. 64% were due to system execution. Okay? Mm -hmm. So on the surface, it appeared that Steve was right. Mm -hmm. But I had noticed some things, and the other people on the teams had noted some, some things. Mm -hmm. And they said, are we being too nonspecific in our evaluations? Mm -hmm. okay? So we decided we were. And so we decided we would go back and review some issues using a 5Y analysis. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and, after we did the 5Y analysis, this mm. is what we found. Mm. We found that that only 8% were what we mm. called system execution issues. Mm. We found 36% were system design issues. Mm. And we found out that 56% mm. were execution issues, but there were management execution issues. Mm. Okay. Now, to, to, to clarify that... Mm. To clarify that, um, what what we did is we'll explain these using four examples, mm. okay? And one example is the production by hour board. Mm. At each one of their, their work cells, they had a production by hour board where mm. they would schedule, plan the work, and then mm. put the, the, the actual production, and they were supposed to act on that information. Mm. Okay? Another one is we're gonna look at floor storehouse locations. Mm. Um, this facility made a lot of their own parts that mm. a huge molding operation in front of their cellular operation. Mm. And they were supplying all kinds of molded parts to the, mm. to the cells and to, to store them. They didn't ship them to the warehouse and withdraw them. They stored them on the floor and store storehouses on the floor. Mm. Uh, we're going to show you the routine five S audit. Mm. And the fourth example is we're going to go through, we're going to go through the cap issue and the cap issue is extremely extremely uh, explanatory as to what the problem is. Really just hold it there, uh, uh, Lonnie. Can you define uh, in brief special system design and management execution? Define yeah, sure. your terms. Okay. Um, uh, special causes are everything else. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the way you find a system design problem is there was a no answer to any of those questions. Mm. Okay. A management execution issue is mm. a is a no answer to those questions when we went through the five why. Mm. But I'll I'll mm. explain what mm. was the deficiency that made it a management execution issue in mm. just a minute. Sure. Okay. But the system design was that they didn't have a work procedure or they didn't have a work standard mm. or they didn't have the resources they need. I understand okay? that. Okay. But the the management execution issue I'll explain as we go through. Sure. Sure. these these examples okay so if we look at the production by hour board 
mm -hmm. found 39 cases of misproduction. Mm -hmm. okay. That's the thing gone wrong. They were supposed to make, you know, 600 pieces and they made 400. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, and so we said, okay, is, is this a, a system problem yeah. or is this a, a, uh, a, an operator problem? Is this due mm -hmm. to a system or is it due to something else? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, here's what the production by hour board looked like. Mm -hmm. Okay. Very simple. We see these frequently. And, and over here in column one, I've got the columns listed right here. You can see the mm -hmm. numbers. Mm -hmm. okay. Here's column one. And here they list the model of production. And so you can mm -hmm. see uh, they, they made some changeovers. Okay. Mm -hmm. And here's the time frame. And in these time frames, you'll notice that there's three numbers. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is uh, these production by hour boards were used during all three shifts. Okay? Mm -hmm. And so the top number is the morning shift, the, the second number is the afternoon shift, and the third number is the, the graveyard shift. It just lists the times. That's mm. all it lists. Mm. Okay. And then then here in this column, column three, mm. it lists mm. the goal. Mm. And if you look here, you can see 617. And below that, you see 617. The first number is the hourly goal. Mm. And the second number is the accumulated goal up to that time. Mm. In other words, if you look at here, you see 617 and you three, see 373, yeah. the total is 900 and... Uh, and There's a cumulative and, one. And, yes, that's the cumulative one at that time. Mm. The next column is the actual rate. Mm. And in this plant, they were kind of clever. If they, if they had a deficiency, mm. okay, they wrote it in red. Mm. The other ones they wrote in either blue or green. Okay. Mm. And here you can see the first hour, instead of producing 617 parts, they produce 270, mm. a clear deficiency. Mm. Okay. Mm. And so when we, when we went to analyze why that deficiency was, mm. okay, we, we found out that, that there was something besides the operators having a problem. Mm. And the problem in this case mm. was that they didn't have the people at the work cell. Mm. So the, the, the other seven people at the work cell, you certainly can't say that's their problem. Mm. It was a management staffing problem. Mm. And what happened is somebody was sick and mm. it took them several hours to find somebody else to fill in that, that uh, cell. Mm. So they, they, they didn't meet production. Okay. Mm. So what was the problem? Was it an operator problem? Well, on the surface, it appears that way because they didn't mm. meet production, mm. but mm. the operators, there's nothing they could do about it. Mm. It was a management execution problem. Mm. The management had not staffed properly. Mm. So that item then became, mm. it went from being okay, mm. you know, and blaming the operator as a, as an execution problem, mm. but it was actually a management problem. Mm. Okay. So does that explain the difference between the management execution and, and the others? Yes. Okay. And so, so we went through this and, and you'll notice here, this is particularly relevant mm. because whenever they have a deficiency, Mm. It, it it you can't even read it because it's a lousy <laughs> picture and to blow it up would be tough but in this column they were supposed to put what the cause was mm. and you notice there's no cause listed mm. <laughs> in column 12 they're supposed to put the corrective action mm. and there's no corrective action listed. Mm. okay so the operators are not following the standard mm. this production board is a transparency standard mm. and they're not following it mm. okay and virtually all the boards look that way. Well, if one or two of them look that way, you could say, hey, it's an operator problem. They're just not doing their job. But when everybody's not doing their job, you got to wonder what the real problem is. And in this case, the operators just did not enforce it. I mean, the management just did not enforce the standards. Seems okay. to be a global phenomenon. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. That it is. Okay. The second one was floor storehouses. I mentioned that they have this molding operation and they would transfer the, the molded parts to the floor mm -hmm. and then they would use them in the work cells. Mm -hmm. And and we had 62 inches issues of 5S. Mm -hmm. okay? The truth of the matter was we could have found 500, mm -hmm. but we just ran out of time. Mm -hmm. And and what were they? Okay, mm -hmm. We found that all these storehouses had floor markings and they were labeled with what mm -hmm. part number belongs there and what container, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And they had floor markings for full containers and empty mm -hmm. containers. Mm -hmm. and, and every specific part was listed. Mm -hmm. It was well labeled. Mm -hmm. From a 5S standpoint, it was very clearly labeled. There was no question what belonged there. Mm -hmm. However, what was there was dramatically different. Mm -hmm. We had mismarked containers. Mm 
Mm. We had full containers in empty locations. We had mm -hmm. empty containers in full locations. Mm. And we had parts in wrong locations all over the place. Mm. Mm. So when when the material handler went to get the parts, he had to hunt all over the place to find the right parts. <laughs> okay. I mean, exactly what 5S is designed to correct. Mm -hmm. okay? So here again, they had a clear standard. The mm -hmm. containers were marked. The mm -hmm. locations were marked. But mm -hmm. they were not executing it. Mm -hmm. Okay. There were 62 inches of this. I say there could have been 300. We probably could have fought 500. Okay? Mm -hmm. As a result of that, mm -hmm. when we did the, um, uh, the 5Y analysis, Mm -hmm. The quality engineer said, this is bonkers. Mm -hmm. He said, do you know that we do a 5S audit every mm -hmm. week? Mm -hmm. A quality engineer comes out and does a 5S audit every week. Mm -hmm. okay? And we've audited these areas. Mm -hmm. So he did a review of mm -hmm. the actual 5S audit. Mm -hmm. okay? <clears throat> and what he did mm -hmm. is he went back 24 weeks mm -hmm. to the prior 24-week 5S audits Mm -hmm. And he found exactly what we found. Mm -hmm. The audit of the 5S procedure showed all these problems. Mm -hmm. In the last 24 weeks, there mm -hmm. was not one corrective action made. Mm -hmm. So the quality engineers listed it, but nobody wanted to act on it. Mm -hmm. okay? And mm -hmm. these audits went directly to the plant mm -hmm. manager. Mm -hmm. So he knew, mm -hmm. but he was taking no action. Mm -hmm. Okay. So th this is the most instructive one. We call mm -hmm. it the cap issue. And it was one that I found. And it was one that we corrected that day while mm -hmm. I was there. Mm -hmm. Okay. They had a, a, a component that mm -hmm. was a, a shaft. And on the end of the shaft, mm -hmm. they had to put a cap. And mm -hmm. then it became part of an assembly. Mm -hmm. And um, it was actually the assembly in, um, in, a, in a door handle that opened the door on a car. Mm -hmm. Okay. And... Um, we found at this workstation, we found 110 instances of quality problems. Okay? Mm -hmm. But one of the instances was a cap, and it was a cap not in position. Mm -hmm. And what would happen is the cap would not be fully installed on the shaft mm -hmm. and it would stick out. Mm -hmm. And at final inspection, mm -hmm. uh, the final ins it would fail final inspection because it was too long. Mm -hmm. And, and um, so I went to the rework station and I asked the operator, I said, hey, you know, how many of these do you have? Mm. And that morning, mm. he had 17. Mm. And uh, I said, well, how many have you done? He said, well, I've done about 40 so far today. Mm. <laughs> 40. Mm. And I was just appalled. And he said, oh, yeah. He said, that's normal. He said, we do that all the time. Mm. He said, I've showed the people what they need to do. It's no big deal. Mm. He said, when you put the cap on, they just push it on. Mm. But he said, it's a slight interference fit. And if you give it a little twist, Mm -hmm. Well, you push it on, it will seat nicely. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I said, well, is that in the operating standard? He says, nope. nope. Mm -hmm. And um, he said, I've told all the operators one time or another, he said, but they just don't do it and whatever. Mm -hmm. And um, so he said, well, there's another problem that is sometimes the caps are greasy mm -hmm. and I have to clean them so I can get a good grip on them to twist them. Mm -hmm. So now we have a, a, a technique of raw material coming in that's mm -hmm. that's that's greasy mm -hmm. and the operators don't have the right technique mm -hmm. so we went to the line and we asked the operator could mm -hmm. you do this mm -hmm. and so we watched him mm -hmm. and he put you know a whole bunch of them on and had no problem and mm -hmm. then he ran into a greasy one mm -hmm. and so we were doing this 5s analysis and so i got the quality engineer and i said hey can we fix this mm -hmm. and he said sure mm -hmm. so we got the the quality engineer to mm. go over to incoming inspection mm. and they set up an inspection station. They mm. pulled all of the, all of the parts that were in the storehouse. Mm. They pulled all of the parts that were at the workstation mm. and took them to this inspection station mm. and uh, rework station and cleaned them all. Mm. And then they gave them back to the operator. We mm. revised the operating procedure, mm. the, the, the lead, uh, the lead hand, the lead, mm. um, the team leader, pardon me. Mm. Um, trained the operator on how to do it mm. and we moved forward mm. and by the end of the day they had cleaned up everything in inventory mm. we had gotten word to the supplier quality engineer mm. and uh, they immediately started inspecting all of the product that came in mm. and the um, quality uh, 
engineer got back with the company. And by the end of the week, the mm. problem had been solved. And they found out there was a, pardon me, there was a problem. Uh, um, pardon me here. In the, um, at the, the facility that made these caps, it was a stamping process and there was a way to get them greasy and they fixed it. And mm. the problem went away. Mm. And so the very next day, we went out on the floor and they had none, no mm. defects at all. Okay? Mm. In a normal day, they would have they would have had 120 or 150 of these. Mm. Okay? So what is it that changed? What's different? Mm. After our five Y analysis, what did we find out? Mm. Okay. We found out they had instructions and they had standards of performance, mm. but the instructions weren't adequate. Mm. They just didn't explain what needed to be done in every case. Mm. Okay. We found out that the instructions had not been updated. Mm. Many of the instructions mm. were dated when the PPAP was made. And in some cases, that was two years earlier. Mm. This is a clear case that mm. that company does not practice continuous improvement. Mm. If they practice continuous improvement, you can't have work instructions that are two years old mm. because you've changed them. You've improved. Mm. Okay? We found that the instructions had never been proven. Mm. We asked people, for, for example, on the on the material handling issue, mm. we interviewed a supervisor mm. and, and we said, well, why why are all these containers in the wrong spot? Mm. And he said, well, when we started up, these these sites mm. weren't sized properly and we couldn't put all the 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 parts in this location and we couldn't put mm. the empties here. Mm. And he said, and it just spun downhill from there. Mm. He said, now they just do what they can. Mm -hmm. And and so in that case, you know, they had never proven out that the process was adequate. Mm -hmm. okay. well, some processes that were adequate were not being followed. Mm -hmm. Okay, like the production by hour boards. Yeah, there the the, the instructions were clear. Mm -hmm. Everything was there, but mm -hmm. they weren't doing it. Mm -hmm. Okay, and management was consciously ignoring it. Mm -hmm. You can't look at that production by hour board. Without mm. saying, wait a minute, there's two big columns on the right with nothing in them. Mm. What's supposed to go there? Mm. Yeah. And and virtually every production board looked like that. Mm. Okay. We found in many cases people hadn't been trained. Mm. Okay. And the key issue is that the performance standards, if they existed, mm. were selectively enforced. Mm. Okay. Now, this is what we call a company that check off the boxes. You know, do you have a procedure? Yes. Okay. <laughs> and do you audit the 5S? Yes. Okay. Mm. If you checked off the boxes, they look good. Mm. But if you really wanted to comply to the standards and meet the intent of the process, mm. they were far from adequate and they were paying a price for it. Mm. Okay. But here's the point, Dr. M. Mm. They are surviving. Mm. And so little attention was given to these issues. Mm. Their management said, hey, we're currently adequate. Mm. Okay. So their bottom line mega issue mm. was what I call, they had what they I call freeway standards. Mm. Okay. Mm. Freeway standards are like, you know, if you're driving down the freeway in El Paso, Texas, the speed mm. limit is 60 miles an hour. Mm. If you're going 60 miles an hour, everybody other than some 92-year-old grandma is passing you. You know, <laughs> it might be dangerous to go 60 miles an hour. Mm. Everybody goes 70 or 75. Mm. It's common to have people on the freeway go 80 mm. and they're not getting stopped and given tickets. Mm. Why? Because the, the, the police selectively and intentionally enforce mm. it mm. In, a, in a way that is not consistent, mm. but they consciously and intentionally ignore it. Mm. Okay. Those are what I call freeway standards. And you can see them in this causal study. Tons of freeway standards. Mm. Okay. So, so the looming questions that we had when we got done with this were, why was manufacturing excellence unable to see these issues? Mm. We found this cap issue. We solved it the same day. Mm. Why were they unable to do it? Mm. There was nothing secret about it. Mm. They had a workstation. They had people sitting there working on it, doing it. Mm. Why were they unable to see it? Mm. Okay. Why were they unable to see what was going on mm. on the on the five S issues? Why mm. were they unable to see what was going on on the production by or board issues? Mm. Well, is it because they couldn't or because they wouldn't? Mm. 
is, is it more than just seeing mm. the physical act of seeing mm. okay the the truth of the matter is it's a little bit more complicated than you would think you would think you know if something's in front of you, you see it but the truth is we all have blind spots mm. we all have things that we really don't see mm. that are right in front of us mm. okay so let's let's have a little fun and let's look at a couple of things mm. to to get our mind calibrated that that maybe we're not a whole lot different than manufacturing excellence mm. maybe we have the same problem maybe mm. we're better who knows mm. but let's look at this logo mm. when people look at that logo they see fedex mm. okay but if you ask them is there something unusual about it mm. this logo got some national awards for excellence mm. okay and, and the reason is there's a subliminal message in there mm. and the message is speed direction uh will get your package to the right spot mm. okay and most people when they look at that they don't see that at all mm. but let me show you a slightly different picture mm. if i if i color one area in mm. Now everybody sees the arrow. Mm. Yep. They see that arrow. Mm. The arrow was there before, mm. but your mind is conditioned to look at the color. Mm. The white stuff is irrelevant. Mm. But if the white stuff happens to be right here, mm. okay, now mm. here's the key. Your mind sees that. Mm. Your conscious mind does not see it, mm. but your, your subliminal mind sees it. Mm. So we didn't see, most people don't see that arrow. Mm. I've shown this, this to, I bet you a thousand people. Mm. And I can't, I don't think five people saw that arrow until I showed it to them. Mm. And the common response I get is I will never look at the FedEx logo again, the same way. <laughs> sure. mm. Well, let's look at another one. Mm. This is Wendy's. Mm. You have Wendy's in India, doc? Yeah, we do have. Yes. Okay. Well, Wendy's is, is you know, appeals to mom and down-home cooking and stuff like that. Mm. And are you a fan of mom's home cooking? Everybody's a fan of mom's yep. home cooking. Yep. Okay, But can you find mom in that picture? Most people could look for hours. <laughs> True. <laughs> but if I show you that, all of a sudden, now you see mom. Mm. Okay. Mm. Well, once again, your mind sees that, even if you don't. Mm. Let's look at another one. The mm. Bronx Zoo. Okay? Mm. This is one of the logos for the Bronx Zoo. Mm. I think this one is just incredible. Mm. And and my question is, the Bronx Zoo, of course, is in New York. Can mm. you see the New York skyline? Mm. I say that and people look at me like I'm crazy. But look right here. <laughs> you can see the top of the Empire State Building. Mm. And, and I don't know what. I think one of those is the Chrysler Building. Okay. But but look at the, the other Bronx Zoo logo. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, can you see the Statue of Liberty? Mm -hmm. Can you see the Empire State Building? Yeah. Okay. People are using this, mm -hmm. okay, and these techniques because our mind can see these things mm -hmm. without us being consciously aware of it. Mm -hmm. And it drives us to do things. It drives us to buy. It drives us to go to the Bronx Zoo. It mm -hmm. drives us to appreciate um, Wendy's. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it drives us to use fedex instead of ups mm. okay our conscious mind may not see it but our unconscious mind drives us to do it and you know you use fedex why do you use fedex well i don't know you know they're good and well maybe it's that logo who knows mm. okay but so so we have some impediments to this awareness mm. okay and so so what prevents us from seeing that okay everybody saw the New York skyline as soon as I showed it to you, okay? mm. but very few people see it before that. True. Okay. So we have some impediments. Okay? Mm. And, and what are these impediments? Okay. There's literally hundreds of them. Okay. Mm. But the big four mm. is what I call a great place to start. Mm. And, and the problems with these impediments are, are, are twofold. Mm. First is most of them are unconscious. Mm. We're not aware of it. Mm. We're not aware when mm. we're looking at the Bronx Zoo that we're also seeing the New York skyline. Mm. We're not aware that when we look at the Wendy's logo, mm. we're thinking about mom's home cooking. Okay? Mm. And, and so if we don't bring them to consciousness, mm. 
Mm. We do not control them. Mm. They control us. Mm. Okay. The second problem is that many of them are inconvenient and socially awkward to discuss. Mm. Okay. Mm. So con consequently, we avoid them and consciously collude with our peers to avoid these elephants in the middle of the room. Mm. If a manager goes into a business meeting and he says, hey, boss, how come nobody pays any attention at all to the production by our voice? Mm. Uh, that's going to be both inconvenient and socially awkward. Mm. What do you mean we're not paying attention to them? Because the managers don't see it. Mm. And then he says, are you aware of that? Mm. And all of a sudden he's kind of throwing darts at the, at the manager. Mm. And so very often we consciously collude to avoid them. Mm. Okay. Somebody had to consciously collude mm. on those audits, those five S audits, mm. one a week going to the manager, nothing being done. Mm. Why didn't the quality manager who was in charge of those go mm. to the plant manager and say, Hey, we're doing these audits for you. Mm. Either pay attention to them or we're going to quit doing them. Mm. That's also a socially awkward and inconvenient thing to handle. Mm. Okay. But it's there right in front of you. Mm. Okay. Sometimes we call those the elephants in the room. Mm. They're an elephant in the room. Mm. If you recognize them, if you don't, there's something else. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Mm. But the, the king to all of these impediments is mm. of, to awareness is a lack of understanding. Mm. Okay. So many people really do not understand mm. so many things that are scary. Mm. Okay. And, and by understanding, I don't mean data, data symbols that gives us properties, you know, mm. like your weight. Okay. Mm. Information allows us to define and differentiate things. Mm. Okay. Like I, I can say, well, I'm 180 pounds and, mm. and, my doctor tells me because of his knowledge, he says, well, that's not good, Wilson. You should lose some weight. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's what knowledge does. Knowledge al allows us to, to make things work. Mm -hmm. Understanding allows us to make things work the way we want them to work. Mm -hmm. That's what you need in a business. Mm -hmm. You don't need just general knowledge. Mm -hmm. General knowledge you can get from a book. Mm -hmm. Okay. But understanding you can only get from practice. Mm -hmm. Okay. Knowledge itself is insufficient. Mm. Although very often understanding starts with book knowledge, mm. but it doesn't end there. Mm. It doesn't end there. It's like the guy who reads about how to improve his golf swing. Mm. He can get all the knowledge he needs mm. there. You know, keep your left elbow straight, tuck in your right elbow, roll your wrist, shift your weight, uh, rotate your hips, all of that you can read about. Mm -hmm. But it's a difference to be able to apply it to yourself. Mm -hmm. Okay. And understanding is born of repeated successful experience. Mm -hmm. If you do not have repeated successful experience, you do not have understanding. Mm -hmm. You may have knowledge, mm -hmm. but you don't have understanding. Mm -hmm. Okay. It takes planned action, timely feedback, and repeated success. And there's no substitute for this. Mm. It is the single most reason, single largest reason, why most initiatives fail to meet their objectives. Mm. The management does not understand their role. Mm. Okay. They simplify things. Mm. And, and part of it is because they haven't done it. Mm. They think they can have understanding by reading about it, by being taught by their sensei or something. They can't. Mm. They can't. They need to get out there and do it. Mm. OK. <clears throat> and, and and I put a caveat in here. I say, be wary of the information and knowledge you gain from books. Mm -hmm. It can have a narcotic effect on you and lull you into believing you really understand. Mm -hmm. You have knowledge, but you do not have an understanding. Mm -hmm. you know? And be wary of the writers who have no actual experience. Mm -hmm. For example, many academics write about lean, but they've never done it. <laughs> and, and what you will find out is this mm. and, and many of them i have tremendous regard for what they're capable of doing mm. okay but i don't have regard for them teaching things that they don't really understand mm. okay and what i find is that what they say they're seldom wrong mm. they're bright people mm. usually mm. okay but what they say is incomplete mm. 
And it's incomplete because a- academics are good at analyzing things. Mm. They do a study, you know, mm-hmm. why is, uh, you know, the water in, in Flint, Michigan bad? They can, they can do that. Mm. Okay. Mm. Because they remember that analysis is breaking things down. Mm. They can break things down. Mm. Okay. But to make something better, to fix it, you now have to put it together. Mm. And as soon as you start putting it together, that's different than breaking it down. Mm. Breaking it down is static. Mm. It's not moving. You go to put it together and all of a sudden you've got standards, you've got people issues, you've got engagement issues, you've got all kinds of things. Mm. Synthesis, putting things together, is much more difficult than analysis, which is taking things apart. Mm. And the only way you can learn how to do, you can be good at synthesis, is to have experience in it. Mm. Okay. So let's go from awareness to competitive awareness. Mm. Okay. To be aware enough, I call it competitive awareness. Okay. Mm. Now, manufacturing excellence, management believes they're aware enough, mm. but they're on the verge. Mm. Okay. If they were more aware, they could be far more competitive. Mm. No question about it. Mm. Okay. And we could look at those numbers and look at those examples. And Mm. those examples are not rocket science. Mm. People are spending all kinds of extra time. Hence, hence they have extra manpower. Mm. Hence, they're expediting and they have quality problems because they can't find the right parts at the right time. Mm. They've got a workstation that's being staffed, taking up space, using resources. Why? Because they didn't have good work instructions. Mm. Because their, their incoming raw materials, which, by the way, that part was specified to come in debris and grease and dirt free. Mm. And it wasn't. Mm. And they were accepting those, putting in the storehouse and sending it to the floor. Mm. And ultimately it showed up at the workstation. Mm. Okay. So they could be more competitive. There's no question. And, and that's why if you look at what I was talking about very early, those solutions are not rocket science. Mm. They're simple. Mm. Well, at least they're technically simple. Mm. Okay. And those are the things they need to do to go from 5.3 to 8.6% mm-hmm. profitability. Okay. And this is just a huge problem with American manufacturers, be primarily because they lack domain critical knowledge. Mm-hmm. They lack domain critical knowledge because they, they have a penchant to stay away from the Ginba. They don't read and study. They feel they've arrived. I'm the plant manager. Whoopie ding. I'm here, you know. Mm-hmm. And they failure to reflect on processes and events. Okay. Mm -hmm. They practice what I call plan, do, hope, and move on. Okay. If you looked at that that production board, Mm -hmm. there was a plan, there was a do, and there was a check. Mm -hmm. And immediately after the check, they ignored it. Mm -hmm. There was no action. They checked and they said, Yep, we didn't meet production day. Okay, let's we didn't meet production this hour. Okay, let's hope and move on. Mm -hmm. Maybe next hour is going to be better. Mm -hmm. It's not PDCA. Mm. It's plan, do, hope, and move on. Okay? I like that. Plan, do, and hope, and move on. Yeah. Well, actually, in this case, it's a different one. I call it plan, do, check, and ignore. Because that's <laughs> what they did. They checked it, and then they ignored it. Okay? <laughs> the, 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 um, the material handling where they, they put the material in whatever location they wanted, the, the, the molded parts, mm. that's plan, do, hope, and move on. Mm. Okay, They had a plan, and they made the parts, and then they just put it up wherever they want. And they hope it works, mm. somebody will find them, and then they, they move on. Okay, mm. So those are what I call a couple of modes of dysfunctional PDCA. Plan, do, check, improve, and plan, do, hope, and move on. Mm. Okay, They spend too little time observing, listening, and reflecting. Mm particularly reflecting mm. you you do not find hand side done I, I have never seen hand side done mm. in a western plant mm. um, when I was with Chevron we used to do a thing called a post-mortem analysis on some projects mm. but not all mm. okay my Japanese clients review every project mm. not just the failed ones every one of them mm. someday I'll tell you the story of me and hand side it was brutal <laughs> But, um, and and there's all kinds of things like that. Mm. And the Japanese have some terms for it. They have a term for Hansai, Mm. for reflection. Mm. They have a term called Nemowashi, which is to talk Mm. about things beforehand, to see, to understand. Mm. 
they have some things that they not only do, but they've given them names. Mm. Okay. But beyond the lack of understanding, there are other impediments. Mm. Okay. Some of them physical. Mm. Physically impeded your ability to see, pardon me. Okay. We'll explore three major psychological issues that are impediments to awareness. Now, don't forget the logos. They're an impediment as well. Mm. But but there's inattentional blindness, mm. change management blindness, mm. and motivated what's called motivated perception. Mm. Okay. So there's there's others. There's over fifty of these that have been cataloged. Mm. Confirmation bias, mm. um, the the illusion of knowledge, the illusion of understanding. Mm. Okay. Um, the illusion of explanatory depth, mm. uh, a whole bunch of psychological dynamics that have been cataloged. Okay. So in for inattentional blindness, let's look at this video. Mm. So let me see if I can play this video. Here we go. This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? So now count the passes the team in white makes. The answer is 13. But did you see the moonwalking bear? Did you see the moonwalking bear, Doc? No, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't. Now watch for the bear. There's the bear. Yep. It, it's easy to 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 miss something that you're not looking for mm. okay and and um in the case of of that inattentional blindness you're set up to fail mm. they tell you to count the passes that the white team makes mm. so what do you do you focus on the white team mm. okay and so when you concentrate on something you miss something else mm. our ability to observe are not limited limitless they are limited mm. okay and so you have that so if you're going out on the floor and you're worried about something mm. you may focus intently on that and mm. miss all kinds of other stuff mm. it's important to understand what this is mm. and basically what it is is there's a price to pay when you concentrate mm. and when you concentrate you lose breath mm. so to speak okay here's another one called change blindness mm. Oops, I got to restart this. You are there we go. About to take part in a quick experiment. Take a look at this. Okay. Now, did you happen to notice anything on? Watch again. See any changes? Don't worry if you didn't see that it's too different. Man. It means your brain is doing exactly what it should be. It's focusing on the meaning of the scene rather than on the irrelevant details. Imagine how much energy and brain mass it would take for us to remember every single person, place, or thing we encountered. The things that matter, a conversation with a coworker or your child's first step, would be drowned by a deluge of information. So when there are minor changes to the world around us, we often don't pick up on them. There are two similar phenomena at work. Inattentional blindness is the failure to notice something that's fully obvious right there in front of you when your attention is engaged on something or someone else. Change blindness is a failure to notice the difference between what's there right now and what was there a moment ago. Scientists such as Daniel Simons from the University of Illinois have spent years devising experiments testing just how perceptive and unperceptive humans actually are. So we feel like we're aware of everything, that we're taking in all of the details, and that if something unimportant happens, we'll automatically notice it. It'll capture our attention. The reality is that 
we often don't notice unexpected things because we're aware of far less of our world than we think we are. So how much or how little are we actually aware of? We decided to recreate one of Simon's most famous experiments to see for ourselves. Here's the setup. Our senior series producer, Vin, poses as a lost pedestrian and asks a passerby for directions. Excuse me, I'm looking for the skyline. Then we break the two up, walking through them holding a large sheet of wood. Now watch as I replace Vin. You might think people would notice the switch, but almost half the time they did. Of course, that means more than half the time they did. We only tried the experiment nine times, and by no means was it good science. But we were surprised four people didn't notice the switch. In Simon's original experiment, seven out of 15 people didn't either. So what determines whether or not you can figure out the switch? When you look at another person, you encode what's relevant for what you're doing right then, in that case, giving directions. And you don't pay attention to the details that are irrelevant, say what color their shirt is or exactly how tall they are. As long as you are able to make sense of the meaning of the scene and roughly the main categories of that person, um, say their height, their age, what race they are, what sex they are, as long as those important things don't change, the meaning of the scene really hasn't changed and you're not going to notice that anything's different. Okay, we'll stop that there. The rest of it is not really germane to what we're doing. but um, That's awesome. You see, that is awesome. Yeah. And uh, there there used to be on YouTube his original experiment, mm. and it was hilarious. Mm. Um, they had uh, in, in one in one instance where they changed, they changed from a a um, a, a man to a woman mm. and the person didn't notice it. Mm. Another one, they changed from a a white man to a black man mm. and the person didn't notice it. Mm. And you look at this and you just you just laughing like crazy mm. but it happens to us mm. and that's that's the thing is to to mm. be aware of it mm. because it can happen mm. and uh, in some ways mm. there's very little you can do about it mm. except to be aware of it mm. and and be and, and be conscious of the fact that you can be fooled mm. okay there's another one uh, let me see if we okay this is another one on change blindness mm. And this is a little bit more subtle. This is a gradual change test. Watch this short film and try to spot the change. Only one thing will change. Did you see it? Few people notice it, even though it happened in plain sight. Here's what changed. <laughs> we think changes draw attention, but we don't realize how much we can miss. We're blind to our own change blindness. Mm. Now that you know what's changing, you can actually see the change happening. It just doesn't draw your attention automatically. Mm. Watch it again. Our overconfidence that we will notice such changes reflects an everyday illusion, the illusion of attention. Check out the book, The Invisible Gorilla, to learn more, www.theinvisiblegorilla.com. This is a great... The, um, th that's a particularly revealing thing to, to people and plants, because things are continually deteriorating. Mm -hmm. It may be your 5S, it may be your cleanliness, it may be who knows what. Mm -hmm. But but since you see it time and time and time and time again, you mm -hmm. see these small increments of change that you don't notice. Mm -hmm. But then over time, it becomes a big deal. Mm -hmm. And and this gradual change test should cause all people who are in production facilities um, a bit of pause. But the, the, the fourth one, uh, after intentional blindness, change blindness, and and understanding, the fourth one is motivated perception. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have a good good uh, YouTube video to show you, mm -hmm. but uh, it's something we all recognize, mm -hmm. and it's the idea that we see what we want to see. Okay? Mm -hmm. 
and and to some extent uh all of those uh videos we saw were because we wanted to see something mm -hmm. we wanted to see the people in, in in white passing the ball but motivated perception is is even more than that mm -hmm. it's that you can see things that are not true mm -hmm. completely untrue mm -hmm. and and um it's next to a, a lack of understanding is the most powerful and most common cause for a lack of awareness. Mm -hmm. um, one of the, the simplest parts of motivated perception is to think about your kids. Mm -hmm. You know, there's things that people will tell you, you know, he's getting a really smart mouth or whatever. And, and you'll say, gosh, I didn't see that, you know, and maybe it's because it happens gradually, or maybe it's because you don't want to see it. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, so, that is a, a huge, a huge factor. And that's one reason why the production manager can go out on the floor and see one thing. The engineer, engineer manager can go out and see another per thing. And the quality manager goes out and sees yet another thing because mm -hmm. their perception is motivated in different ways. Mm -hmm. It's one of the reasons that, that, that team problem solving is, is sometimes a very powerful technique. Mm -hmm. But the biggest problem is that you, everybody's busy. Mm -hmm. So they're motivated not to find more problems. Mm -hmm. So, so what do they do? They see less problems. Mm -hmm. okay. And, and it's a manifestation that we are unaware mm -hmm. of our unawareness. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what does this awareness, how does it affect our culture? Okay. Well, keep in mind that culture is the combined thoughts, beliefs, actions, artifacts, and language of any group of people. Mm -hmm. It can be a church, it can be a region of the country, it can be an area, it mm -hmm. can be a corporation, it can even be a plant, mm -hmm. and it can even be a group within the plant. Mm -hmm. Okay, The maintenance organization may have a different culture than the production organization. Mm -hmm. Okay, But at the end of the day, it's best described by just how we do things around here. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, In other words, you know, those, those 5S markings on the floor... And those containers go going where they're going. Mm -hmm. Why do we do that? Well, that's just how we do things around here. Mm -hmm. Why do we not fill out the production by hour board completely? Mm -hmm. Well, that's just how we do things around here. It's part of their culture. And part things that are part of your culture, very often you're blind to. Mm -hmm. okay. So at Manufacturing Excellence, how do we explain their issues mm -hmm. with the production by hour board? Mm -hmm. The deficiencies on the production data? the cap problem mm -hmm. the 5s standard for inventory okay mm -hmm. how do we explain those and then ignore the audit that clearly shows we're not following our standards mm -hmm. how do we explain all of those mm -hmm. okay because some things we can't see mm -hmm. mostly because we're not looking hard enough mm -hmm. other things we see but choose to not change them mm -hmm. regardless they become a cultural norm they became just how we do things around here Mm -hmm. and and when we pointed this out to our team their their universal reaction all the other people in the team said god i had no idea it was so bad mm -hmm. i had no idea there was so much opportunity i had no idea there's so much low-hanging fruit mm -hmm. and and it it it's perpetuated by what i call the can't won't don't culture Okay, we can't do it because they don't do it around here. We won't do that, you know. Um, and and the, the the reality is that some can't and some won't, but in the end, too many don't. Mm -hmm. You know, if we look at those that production by hour board, mm -hmm. they could fill it out if they wanted to, but they don't. Why don't they? Mm -hmm. Okay. And and I I like to show it as a Venn diagram, mm -hmm. and and I like to say that pe people look at this culture and they say, well. It's because can we do things? Are we capable? Okay. Have we been trained? Okay. And if we show that as a circle, that's our that's our ability. Mm -hmm. Okay. And and then the other is can we do it? Are we permitted? It's not just ability, but are we permitted to do it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Like for example, the the uh the operator at the rework station, mm -hmm. he knew what needed to be done and he went over and told the operators, but they didn't do it. Okay, he was not permitted to give them instructions in their culture. You need to chase something down, Doc. Okay. Go ahead. That's fine. That's fine. I just okay. 
Very true. And, and then the third part of the can't, won't, don't culture is will do. Do we want to do it? Do we have the motivation? Do we have the drive? Okay. Mm -hmm. And so if you look at these these three areas mm -hmm. and you say, what are the deficiencies? Mm -hmm. uh, oh, pardon me. And the sweet spot is when you can do it, you're capable. And when you can do it because you're permitted and when you will do it because you want to. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's the do sweet spot. That's when you get things done. Mm -hmm. okay? But if you look at why things don't get done, mm -hmm. if you look at the 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 void of the will do mm -hmm. when it's missing, mm -hmm. you find out that we talk about things like motivation and courage and management mm -hmm. walking the talk. Mm -hmm. and, and somehow we have a fear restraint to see and do things. Mm -hmm. okay? on, on the other hand, if we look at the, the void spot for the can do in terms of capability, mm -hmm. people need instructions, they need training or they need resources. Mm -hmm. okay? And if we look at the deficiency in the, the permitted to do, they need more autonomy. Okay. Mm -hmm. But none of these matter if they don't see it. Mm -hmm. If they have instructions and okay. And, and that was one of the big problems. They didn't see these things as problems. Okay. And and to be capable and to be allowed to and to be willing are interesting traits. Mm -hmm. But they're only relevant, just like the gateway quality, if you see the opportunity. If you don't see the opportunity, then nobody's going to attack it. Mm -hmm. So that's why I keep preaching that awareness is the gateway quality of improvement, improvement and success. It's not solutions. We saw from the examples. Mm -hmm. I showed you from my study. Mm -hmm. Okay, And here's the point. Until you are aware, nothing else matters. Mm -hmm. That's why people don't look for problems. Why? Because then there's a problem. There's something that they have to do. So if they don't see it, then they don't have to act on it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what must we do about this? What, what, what are we going to do? How are we going to fix this? Mm -hmm. Dr. Deming encapsulated the solution in his second point. He said, adopt a new philosophy. Mm -hmm. We are in a new economic age. Mm -hmm. Western management must awaken to the challenge they must become aware of the challenge they must awaken to the challenge mm -hmm. they must learn their responsibilities and take on leadership for change mm -hmm. awaken is the key word there wake up look see what's around you okay mm -hmm. become more cognizant well that's easier said than done mm -hmm. that is easier said than done mm -hmm. but let's talk about some specific points mm -hmm. how can managers awaken mm -hmm. you know it, it's like saying work harder you know i'm working as hard as i know how okay you have to change some things around them mm -hmm. so they can be clued in to what's different mm -hmm. and if these are natural if many of these are unconscious mm -hmm. they're not even aware that they have a problem mm -hmm. but here's one solution surround yourself with people that are smarter than you are mm -hmm. and people who are willing to challenge and question you mm -hmm. i find managers are scared to death to surround themselves with people that are smarter than them. Well, they're going to replace me. You know, I'm not going to get promoted. They're going to get promoted. Okay? Mm. And, and, and they don't like being questioned and challenged. I'm the boss. Mm. Who are you to question me? Mm. That, that is the, one of the biggest sources of, of fear in an organization I can think of. Mm. Another thing mm. with this dynamic group, practice open, honest, fast, fact-based dialogue. Mm. If that quality manager went into the plant manager and said, hey, we've done this audit for 24 weeks mm -hmm. and here's the result and there's not one corrective action implemented or recommended. Mm -hmm. What should we do? That's open, honest, fact-based dialogue. Mm -hmm. But it's also in-your-face dialogue. Mm -hmm. This goes to you, boss, and you didn't do anything. Mm -hmm. okay? And so it's, it's easy to say that. It's far mm -hmm. more difficult to do it. Mm -hmm. Another thing, we must process, we must understand the processes at our level. Mm -hmm. We call this domain critical knowledge. The plant manager does not have to know precisely why the cycle time of a process is such and such. Mm -hmm. But he does need to know that there is a cycle time. He does need to know that it impacts the, the production rate. And he does need to know that everybody's the same. And he does need to know that the line can be balanced. And there's a lot of things he needs to know at his level. We call that domain critical knowledge. Mm -hmm. 
so many managers want to wipe their hands of it and say, hey, I can't be bothered with the details. That's why I have people. Mm -hmm. and, and, and there's a bit of truth to that. But the problem is when it comes time to make a decision, <laughs> what are they going to do? Mm -hmm. When the quality manager comes in and says, hey, we've got all these audits and says we're not following our procedures. Now the manager has to decide, what am I going to do about that? Mm -hmm. And if he doesn't know how 5S is, is administered, if he doesn't know about the flow of parts on the floor, he can't participate in it. Mm -hmm. He has to have domain critical knowledge. Mm -hmm. Another thing is that we must accept okay, that we have or may have mm -hmm. debilitating unawareness. Mm -hmm. We've got to recognize that we don't see everything. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we must study and read and continue to learn we must listen to others. And at the end of the day, we must make cold, hard, dispassionate, and introspective analyses of ourselves and all of our systems. Mm -hmm. We've got to reflect hard on what we do. We've got to practice handsight. We've got to practice nemanawashi. Okay. Now, those are things that any manager can do. Mm -hmm. And all of those things will help them improve their awareness. Now, there's a million other things you could do. But my history tells me that if people do that, 99% mm -hmm. of the problem is taken care of. Okay. So, so what's the bottom line to all of this? Okay. We've presented a problem. We've given you some countermeasures. Okay. The countermeasures lie in the hands of management. But if we look at this analysis, we see that the biggest problem is in management execution. Mm -hmm. Management not providing resources. Management not providing standards management not enforcing standards mm -hmm. management not staffing it properly so everything can be done mm -hmm. okay and so the the causal analysis clearly showed us where the problems were mm -hmm. clearly showed us where the problems were mm -hmm. so now what are we going to do about it okay the bottom line to this there's no other analysis that can be made management simply must up their game mm -hmm. they must improve the things that they're supposed to do they're supposed to make sure that the standards are good. They're most supposed to make sure that the standards are enforced. They're supposed to make sure the place is properly staffed and organized. And here you can see examples of all of those being violated. Okay. Now, when I show this to managers, they they get upset. They say, well, you're saying that management is a problem. Well, that's true. They are the problem. Mm -hmm. But they also are the solution. Mm -hmm. Nobody can fix these problems except management. Mm -hmm. Nobody, okay? Okay. And it, at Quality Consultants, we say this time and time and time again. It's all about management. The rest is just details. Mm -hmm. If management ups their game, this is, this is going to be self-correcting almost immediately. And the gains are huge. The gains are huge from not only just profit improvement, but if they implemented these things, I will guarantee you the morale in that plant will skyrocket. Okay. And now my question for you is this. Are you willing to do some cold, hard, honest, introspective analyses about yourself and your company? How are you like or better than or worse than manufacturing excellence? We've shown you by example the things that they do. Now look at your company by those same examples. How well do you do? How much money are you leaving on the table? If if there's one thing I want to leave you with, it's it's that thought. What am I going to do? I was recently involved in a in a blog on LinkedIn, and a, a guy said something that I think was really really relevant. He said. Although there's no I in team, improvement starts with I. Mm -hmm. And and that's that's something that I would like to bring to you as a as a question. What are you going to do about it? Okay. Actually, there's there's a path here that I've I've laid out that shows you how you can gather the information that you need to improve. So it's there. Now the question is, what are you going to do about it? Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the time. Thank you for the for your your attention. Um, and I I want to leave you with one final word, and that is uh, that uh, 
having taken this uh, webinar with, with Dr. M and I, uh, that makes you a student of mine. And one of the deals I make with all my students is if you are ever a student of mine, you can always be a student of mine. And so I have all my contact information up there. You can contact me there. Well, I guess I don't have my phone number, but you can contact me via via email or um, or the web and and um, get in touch with me and we can chat about problems that you happen to have, whether they're work problems or personal problems at work or career objectives, or you want to learn about some strategy of lean or, or if you want to talk about soccer, soccer is always on the agenda. And uh, with that, I will leave you. I'll thank you, Dr. M. And, and uh, I'll leave the final word to you. Dale, uh, I'll add one more, uh, which, uh, which Lonnie said uh, that he has not presented here, but I have it. And that's his phone number. And I assure you, <laughs> I can ring him up anytime. And he has never disappointed me because I can vouch for what he said. Once I'm, I'm a student, and I can pick up my phone and ring him up anytime, and he picks it up from wherever he is. Thank you very much, Lani, for this lovely presentation. It was such a oh, thank you, Dr. M. that I really enjoyed it. And we wait for a lot of questions from all the people who are looking at it in my YouTube channel and my LinkedIn page. And thank you very much. I'm going to stop recording, sir. Take care. <laughs>